Yay Networks. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Sour Loss Sweet Lessons. I'm your host, Deshauna Barber, and I'm so excited to be welcoming you back for another episode. As you know, Sour Loss Sweet Lessons is all things self-care, self-love, and self-improvement. So let's dive into today's episode. It is called What Love is Blind Teaches Us About Settling. Whew, you all know this is a little bit different than what I normally do. Um, I don't normally do a lot of pop culture, TV shows, movies, like the that industry is not really something that I talk about. But honestly, I wouldn't mind stepping into it just a little bit because I do think that there's so many lessons that we get out of watching TV shows, especially reality TV. And we see people, and we hope that this is real, but let's let's assume that it is. We see people going through real life experiences and it creates a dialogue that I think is really important, especially for individuals that are in the dating space, individuals that are looking for their person and really individuals that are in a self-improvement journey. We're all trying to become better human beings and we're all trying to find the right way to not only love ourselves, but open space to love others. And to do that, there has to be a lot of self-awareness and self-reflection. And when I was watching Love is Blind, I can't tell you all how triggered I was in a lot of the instances where I saw people getting their heart broken. I saw struggles with communication. I saw a lot of messiness and individuals doing things that were clearly disrespectful and toxic. And it kind of just brought me back to a lot of the instances that I've experienced before I got married and before I found Marvin, the types of relationships that I found myself in, I'm not going to deny, have been pretty similar in some moments to some of the couples that were on Love is Blind. Now, for those that don't know, Love is Blind is a Netflix show and they have individuals that go into these pod like rooms and they get to know each other and they fall in love without ever seeing each other in person. And by the end of the experiment, they decide to get engaged. And when they finally see each other face to face, one person gets on one knee and they propose. And a month after that, they are at the altar. Now, after the engagement, they go on the honeymoon, they move in together, they get to know each other, and that's when all hell breaks loose, (laughs) is when they actually move in with each other. But uh, they end up, at the end, meeting at the altar and deciding, is love really blind, and deciding to either commit to each other or don't. Out of all the couples, only one made it to the end and actually got married. Two couples made it to the altar, only one actually got married. And the couple that I want to talk about specifically is A.D. and Clay. (laughs) Now, there's another couple that I also am going to reference. I believe it's Chelsea and either her name is Laurel or Lauren. Let me see. Jeremy and I think it's Laurel. Let me just verify. Yeah, Laura. Um, Jeremy and Laura. But majority of this is going to be about Clay and A.D. So they are both uh, two black individuals. And obviously I connected with them as well because they're also black. So I also feel like I was really triggered by some of Clay's behaviors because of the men that I've dated have also been black. I've dated outside my race a few times, um, but... The long-term relationships that I've been in, the toxic relationships that really impacted me the most have been um, 
by black men. They, they've been 99% of the men that I've dated. So when I saw the way that he was acting, I was like, man, he kind of reminds me of a few of my exes. Like <laughs> he is kind of uh, triggering me. And I think probably what got me the most is the ability for a man to waste your time. <laughs> and I feel like we can all agree that Clay wasted AD's time and had her on national television with no actual desire to marry her in the end. And I think we could all see that from the very beginning, but I also think that he made that pretty clear when he had a conversation with AD after the altar. And he said, you know, it just wouldn't be fair to you. I'm not ready. And, every, and, and just in my opinion, if you're saying you're not ready to get married, why did you come on the experiment if you're not ready to get married. We all know that this experiment in the end is a proposal in a marriage, an actual legal marriage. So with those statements, it just tells me that he wasn't, he wasn't ready, but I want to hone in on a specific thing that AD said. Okay. After clay at the altar said, it wouldn't be right to you to say, yes, I'm not going to say yes. She left, and the first thing that she said to her family as she was crying, she says, I'm just never enough. And boy, did that hit my heartstrings. And quite frankly, that was probably one of the most reposted clips in a lot of what people were talking about in this conversation was the fact that she said, I'm just never enough. We, especially as women, can all relate to feeling like you're never enough. And it's very easy to allow that emotion to dictate your actions in relationships following. And this is what I mean. Because I didn't feel like I was enough in this relationship, the next relationship I get into, I'm going to go over and beyond to prove my worth. I'm going to go over and beyond to be someone that the individual loves and wants to be with. Like I'm going to overdo it and I'm going to overcompensate for the previous relationships I've been in, in which I felt like I wasn't enough for that person. Here's the thing. You're never going to be enough for the wrong person. Never. And I don't know about you all, but every time a relationship didn't work out, once I kind of hit my 30s, I wouldn't say I got happier, but I was content with the fact that I'm not wasting time with individuals that I'm not meant to be with. So I was accepting of the fact that these relationships are not working out because good. It was a month for me to figure it out with him, two months to figure it out with him, three weeks to figure it out with him. I'm not wasting my time because I am determining very early on that this individual is not the individual for me. And I appreciate the minimal time that was invested in finding that out. And I only say this because I've been in relationships that were three and a half years one and a half years in these long-term relationships. And it took me so long in years of my life to realize that this person isn't for me. So I have a appreciation for minimal time invested <laughs> with realizing when she says, I'm just never enough. I think us as women, we have to be careful of having that mindset because we will then start settling. And that's why this episode is called What Love is Blind Teaches Us About Settling is because in the end, you still don't end up winning. And the reason why I think that AD was set settling in this instance is because, or in this experiment is because I think that Clay showed multiple moments where he wasn't dependable, he wasn't reliable, and he was kind of a little bit sketchy throughout 
their time of moving in with one another, specifically the moments when she sat down, it was her mom and Clay, and she kept telling her mom that Clay just hasn't been coming home. And I cooked dinner and I set up a little paint, um, uh, uh, um, a, I can't get this word out, a like painting experience for us to do when he never came home. And she was like, what does he work for the, I think she said the CIA or the FBI or Homeland Security, like what does he do where he's not coming home? And she's like, oh, you know, he owns Airbnbs and rentals and stuff like that. And she's just looking like, okay. I'm not going to judge AD, and I'm really not going to judge anyone because, gosh, if you've been watching this, uh, <laughs> this show, if you've been watching my podcast, you know that I have had a lot of moments in which I have ignored bright red billboard signs, uh, billboard signs, and I, I am a person that does not judge. And I'm going to tell you all a story soon about a moment in which I settled and just ignored. And it just ends up, you end up losing on the ends. But um, I feel like him not coming home was one of the biggest red flags that we could have here. And I wish that AD had really let that part of his behavior sink in because we all walk around with rose colored glasses. And when we are in love, we are just so taken aback by individuals and really not even in love when we're infatuated. We're so taken aback by individuals that if we were not in the infatuation phase, none of this would be looked over but a lot of things are looked over in that infatuation phase because we are just so enamored with the person and we have to be very careful about that first I would say nine months of a relationship because everyone is wearing their best mask and you really have to wait for it to fall off and for you all to be put through challenging instances for you to really realize who a person is. I think that Clay showed pretty on that he was a person that was not dependable. He even showed up late to the lunch with AD's mom. He didn't show up with any flowers or anything. And even the proposal, which when I was watching, it was Marvin and I were watching it together. He proposed and everyone else when they proposed and mind you they're proposing through a wall you can put decorations in the other person's suite or pod and I noticed that everybody else's proposal there was flowers waiting for her in her pod and chocolates and a glass of wine and all of that but in 80s room there was I think tequila so after he proposed with a Bible in his hand, they took a shot of tequila, if I'm not mistaken. And I'm just like, where are the flowers at? Like, where's the romance in it? And I just, I didn't like that. I didn't like that. I felt like she deserved more than a tequila shot. I did not like how it felt like Clay is doing the absolute bare minimum. And settling actually is not necessarily saying, oh, this person is not good enough. Sometimes the person is good enough and you're just settling for bare minimum, bare minimum effort. And I felt like that's what she was settling for, that Clay is a good looking guy. He has a lot to offer. He has a great job from what I can tell. He's very well off. He's very well spoken. Um, he comes from a pretty good family. Like everything about Clay, I would say, would make him a quote unquote high value man, as they call it. What I question is if he has a high moral compass. And I think that that always feeds into a person's value. And if you're not coming home to your fiance, and when she questions you about it, it turns into an argument. 
it just sounds to me like he has mental and emotional behaviors that he needs to work on. And then therefore I think that she's settling because to me, I don't think that he was doing enough to prove that he would be a worthy husband. And therefore I believe that she was settling. And what's interesting is that I think he agrees with me because he clearly said that he's not ready. He needs to get into therapy and he needs to this and he needs to that. It tells me that he knows that he's not ready. But do you know that he's not ready? And sometimes we're all so ready to be chose. And I know that that was a slang way to say it, but, you know, we all want to be chosen. But, you know, like I want to get chose, you know, like I, I think that it's just a sticky place to get to a point where I'm open to accepting anyone that accepts me. And I was watching this podcast. It's like the mind of a CEO, CEO mindset, life of a CEO. Yeah, it's life of a CEO. It's a really, really, really good podcast that I've been watching. I only discovered it a few months ago. And there was a guy on there, I forgot his name, but he was like a really big dating expert. And he said one thing that I found that women do in dating that is not healthy is that they're not choosing, they're waiting to be chosen. And they accept the people that chooses them versus being the one that's choosing. And oh my gosh, that hit me so heavy because I absolutely used to be the person that would wait to be chosen. And I'll tell you all a little bit more right after this break. Welcome back from the break. Okay, so like I was saying before, settling is more than just who the person is. Sometimes you're settling for the behavior. And we all have to reckon with the fact that settling can not only destroy your life, I actually think that it can become dangerous for you. I've settled so many times in my life. I got fed up by the time 2020 hit. And one day I'm going to tell my stalker story. I just got to get myself mentally there. But what I will say about my previous relationship is that I've still got a storage unit <laughs> full of stuff that my ex refuses to give back to me. This is a gentleman that I settled for in 2019. We dated from 2019 all the way through the summer of 2020. And I remember after we broke up, just wanting my things back. <laughs> and it's been, it's 2024 now. So in the summer, it'll be four years. And he still has a storage unit full of my stuff. And I have no one to blame but myself. I have no one to blame but myself because he showed me multiple times that one, he wasn't good enough for me. He wasn't a good human being. And I ignored those red flags. And now I not only have PTSD from the relationship, I also lost everything that I owned. When me and him moved, we were living together and I moved from Chicago to Virginia in 2019 to live with him. And then he got stationed in Hawaii. So I put all of my things into his military storage unit and I went to Hawaii with two suitcases. So all of the stuff that was in the storage unit was an apartment, an entire one bedroom apartment full of stuff, including a lot of my mom's valuables. And I thought to myself, we're gonna be together, it's no big deal. Um, when, he, when we find a different place or when we finally get settled into the home that we were building in Hawaii, 
he can release the stuff from the storage unit to go into our home in Hawaii. It had never crossed my mind that this man that I haven't even been with for a year could end up to be a bad person. It never even crossed my mind that this relationship may not work out. I've told you all in previous episodes that I think with your dreams, you just need to be to the point of delusion. Just go for everything that you want in this world. And in your mind, I want you to believe that it's going to work out. In relationships, do not have that mindset. <laughs> in relationships, do not have that mindset. I am a big believer in being that convinced with our dreams but when it comes to your dreams it's between you and your dream okay it's all based on your work and the things that you're going to do to put into getting to your dreams relationships are not like that there's a whole nother human being that's in this bond with you that could steer this relationship in the wrong direction you never want to be so convinced that you are then stupid. And what happened to me is I was so convinced we had only been together for like seven months by then. And I said, you know, this is going to be my forever person. Even though he had shown me thousands of signs that he was off and a little different and a little scary too, I still stuck around. And now here I am in 2024 and I don't have any of my stuff. Obviously, I've rebuilt, you know, my home and my wardrobe and things like that. But there are valuables in there that I'm never that I don't know if I'm ever going to get back, including valuables that were my mom's. So we have to be careful about settling. And I think the things that A.D. said were so relatable because she spent a lot of time talking about not feeling like you're enough. And one thing we have a tendency to do, because I believe she's in her early to mid thirties, man, once we hit that 30 year mark, we start thinking that there's just not enough human beings on the earth. And this one guy, I got to make this work because there's no other male or female available on the planet. And that's just not true. We have to really step out of that. There are millions of people on this planet. And this one person not working out is not going to be the end of the world. If it's meant to be, it'll be. And one thing I think Love is Blind taught us about settling is that it's hard to recover from being in a relationship that you know you shouldn't have been in. There's a lot of self-loathing that comes with that because you're beating yourself up because you know you shouldn't have did it. I feel so powerful when I know that I walked away from a situation that was not healthy for me. I walked away without needing to be pushed. I walked away without needing a dramatic thing happening, a, a dramatic thing to happen. There is something really powerful with knowing that I saw the sign. I chose myself. I put myself first. I believed my intuition. I walked away and I'm proud of myself for that. There is so much pride that comes with knowing your worth and not settling for anything below it. And then there's the opposite side where you don't really know your worth. And when things don't work out, you think to yourself, man, I should have saw this. And then now you're going to spend all this time beating yourself up, wondering why you didn't walk away when you had the chance. So this happened to me in actually after the breakup with the guy in Hawaii um, another gentleman that I had dated lightly a few years prior had reached out. We went on a date and, you know, we hung out, um, for only maybe 
a month at most before I knew that this was not for me. But there was one red flag that really did it for me. My best friend was deployed at the time. And this was her second or third deployment. This girl deploys all the time. She's in the military. And I remember we were watching the... I think it was the VP debate. I think it was the vice presidential debate, if I'm not mistaken. I got to go back and look, but... Um, Kamala, Vice President Kamala Harris was on the television and she was talking about soldiers overseas and the dangers of deployments. And I felt a little triggered by it because my best friend was overseas. And you know what? I think she might have actually even been talking about sexual assault, if I'm not mistaken. And I was a little triggered. Now, mind you, these videos and these like presidential debates, they're live, but they'll be on TV, YouTube tomorrow. You can watch the whole thing on YouTube tomorrow. It's not a big deal. I was so triggered as we were watching it that I said, hey, you know, can you turn this off? I'm a little triggered. You know, my best friend's deployed. I just don't want to talk about soldiers dying overseas. Like it just, it scares me. And he said, no, I want to watch this. And I said, but I'm telling you that I feel really triggered. Is there something else that we can watch? Because my best friend is deployed and I just, I don't want to even see this conversation about things that happen to soldiers overseas. And he said, no, I really want to watch this. I've been waiting all day to watch this. And I said, okay, then I'm just going to go in the bedroom as you watch it. And as I'm walking to the bedroom, I said, you know what? Actually, I'm leaving. <laughs> Actually, I'm leaving because this is incredibly inconsiderate and it's rude. Period. It's inconsiderate and it's rude. And it is very clear to me that you lack empathy. So I start packing up my stuff and he just chills. Like he's just walking in as I pack my stuff, I leave and I'm gone and I go downstairs and I get to my car. Now, mind you, we're in D.C., we're in Northeast uh, DC. I walk up to my car. My car window is broken out. Yep, my car window is broken out. And I am so upset. So I call him because, you know, this is not the safest place in Washington DC, although the apartment building was a luxury apartment building, very expensive to stay in. The neighborhood surrounding it was a very dangerous neighborhood. So as soon as I called him, I'm just looking around trying to make sure that nobody is around me that could rob me. I couldn't tell if the window got busted out five minutes ago or 10 hours ago. I don't know. So he's not answering the phone. So then I walk back up to the apartment building. It's late. It's probably like nine or 10 o'clock. And you have to get you have to call up to the person and then the person tells the front desk to let you in. He wasn't answering the phone, so they weren't letting me into the building. So as I'm like banging on the door and they're like, hey, you know, call your person. I'm like, no, like I can't get in touch with them. The guy finally sees that I'm frantic and opens up the door. And I said, I'm so sorry. Uh, my friend is upstairs. He's not answering, but my, when my car window is busted out and I'm a little bit afraid. Um, to get too close to the car. And I honestly don't want to drive home like this. I'd like to, you know, put a garbage bag or something on the window. Again, he's not answering. I get all the way upstairs, y'all. <laughs> and I'm knocking on the door. He's not answering. It has been maybe five minutes, 10 minutes since I left and I came back. It's not like he left the building or something like that. He's not in the shower. I'm just banging on the door. I'm banging on the door, y'all, From and now I'm upset because now I'm like, oh, so now you're being, now you're really being a mean person. I was going to say a cuss word, but I don't know if I want to start cussing on this uh, podcast. But now you're really being a dickhead. Let's say that. Now you're really being a dickhead. And as I'm banging on the door, 
probably for like three minutes. And I'm listening to the door. Trying, like, am I crazy? Like, I just need, can you just give me some tape in a garbage bag so I could tape up my window and go? Like, he's not answering. So after about four minutes, he walks up to the door and he's like, what's going on? I'm like, why are you not answering your phone? Why are you not answering the door? I've been banging on your door for four minutes. What are you doing? He's like, oh, I had my AirPods in. Okay, so if you had your AirPods in, aren't your AirPods connected to your phone? Yeah. So your AirPods didn't ring or anything to say that you were, that you were, that I was calling you? Like, what are you doing? And I'm so frantic that it doesn't even register to me. I say, you know what? I just need a garbage bag and some tape because my window is busted out. He's like, oh, and then suddenly he goes from being a complete dickhead to being a kind, nice, oh, let me help you. Oh, 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 oh. And I was just, and I just said, you know what? I'm just going to go home. So I go back downstairs and he follows me back downstairs. I call the police. Um, I think I filed a police report and he's helping me get my bags in the car. And we didn't even bother taping it up because I was just so over it. I just really wanted to go home. So I hopped in the car. He's like, are you going to be okay? Blah, blah, blah. And I just drive off. you really understand who a person is in a time of conflict. I can be so mad at my husband, y'all. Like, and I feel like everyone's like that in relationships where you just get so mad at your partner. But the way I'm not going to ignore you when I'm mad at you, the way I'm still going to treat you with respect, I'm still going to be warm, I'm still going to be kind. And, and I would probably give myself an eight out of 10 at, how we are in conflict. Like I'm pretty good, but there are some days where I just give me some space. But this guy, like when I'm, when I make him upset, he is just the sweetest person still the most understanding patient. Like he is just so kind when we have conflict. This other gentleman in DC, on the other hand, a complete and utter piece of crap. And that was really one of the straws that broke the camel's back with him as I started peeping some behaviors. Like I started seeing stuff. I'm like, you know what? I think he might, no, I want to say he's a narcissist, but he might have some narcissistic traits. And I got myself to the point where, yep, I'm done. Blocked him on everything. He would call, he would text, and I would block, and then he would start emailing me, and then I had to threaten him via email. If you attempt to contact me again, I'm going to file a restraining order against you. Because he also did more things, which I can't go into detail about. <laughs> he did more things that were very clear to me that he's just not a empathetic or respectful person. But that was one of the first indications that this person is not a nice person. And if I had ended up married to him or in a long-term relationship with him, I would be miserable. I would be miserable. The reason why settling is so dangerous is because you are creating a long-term marathon of pure misery if you settle. It is the truth. If you choose to be patient and wait it out, like I did, I settled, but I never got married. I never ended up having a child or anything that would bind me to an individual that I don't want to be bound to. And I'm so grateful for that, that uh, I had God's protection from what could have been a lifetime altering decision by being with someone who has clearly shown me that they're not a good, honest, or empathetic, or kind individual. And now I feel very grateful because I look at my life now and Marvin's not perfect, but he is close enough, honey. <laughs> close enough. So I look at women like AD and I actually don't know if she realizes how big of a bullet she dodged when Clay sat at the altar and said, no, I don't want to marry you. I don't think she realizes how many years of heartache 
she just saved herself or he just saved her because it is very clear to me that his love for her was not as much love as she had for him. And she said something else, actually, after her statement. She said, I just feel like I'm always so close and I keep doing so much for these men and carrying these relationships and it's never enough. I understand. I understand, sis. I get it. We have all been there. Where it's like, I'm doing everything that I can to love on you, support you, be the glue to this relationship, and you still don't want to marry me. But it just brings us back to the initial point that you'll never be enough for the wrong person. You'll never do enough for the wrong person. You'll never smile enough, laugh enough, cook enough, clean enough. You'll never be affectionate enough. You'll never be enough for the wrong person. And we have to take our time, and I know it's hard, but we have to wait as long as it takes until the right person comes along. And that person will be worth the wait. There are millions of people on this planet. If this one person does not work out, there are other fish in the sea. We can't operate from this scarcity mindset. Nor can we pour so much into individuals that are not pouring into us. It's just such a waste of time. And the gentleman that I was talking about in D.C., if I had settled for him, I would have signed up for a marathon of misery. He was a piece of crap and he would have been a horrible partner. He would have been a very negative, mean person because he was very mean spirited. That was clear. And they always say when a person shows you who they are, believe them. He showed me in that moment that I'm going to let her, I know he sat on the other side of that door laughing as I was banging on the door. I know it. I know that as I was uh, uh, calling his phone, he sat there, stared at the phone laughing. He enjoyed watching me try to contact him over and over again. He enjoyed listening to me bang on the door when my car was broken into and I needed help. He liked that. That's scary, you guys. That is, that is, that's deeply disturbing that a person is enjoying watching you squirm. That is a mentally sick person. And the best decision I ever made was walking away from that. And he only took up a month of my life. I, I think about the people that have taken up years and those are people I deeply regret. But I can live with the fact that Shauna it took you a month to figure it out. I can live with that. That's pretty good. It's the years that bother me the most. The years of red flags that I ignored. You give me a month of red flags, I'm giving myself some uh, credit for walking away. And those are the ones you can look back and say, I look back and I'm like, thank you, Lord, that I left him <laughs> and I stood up for myself and I realized I was worth more than this behavior. And literally, weirdly enough, two months later, Marvin came along and we are happily married now. Happily married. So settling is never worth it. Walk away quickly and realize that we all deserve so much more than bad behavior and minimal effort from people that claim to care about us. We deserve more because we provide more. And right after this break, I will tell you all the lessons. <music> Thank you.
Welcome back from the break. Okay, I've only got a few lessons because I feel like throughout this episode, I really said some pretty good learning spots for you all to take away. But I've got one or two kind of that I really want to make sure I highlight. The first one is so important. Listen to family members you trust. With every single man I have been in a relationship with, except for Marvin, my family has been 100% against it. Hands down. And I'm embarrassed to say that, but it's the truth. My family and my friends, the people I love, trust, respect, none of them have liked any of the men I've dated. Not a single man I've dated have they been like, yes. Marvin is the first one. The first one. The reason why I'm saying listen to family members you trust and not just listen to family members is because there's always a few bad apples that maybe have weird motives or something like that from being able to pull you away from a person you're in a relationship with. But the people you trust, they want to see you happy. They want to see you happy, healthy, honored, appreciated, taken care of. They want to see that. If your family that you trust and friends that you trust do not like your partner, you need to evaluate that relationship. I'm sorry. They see things that we can't see when we're in the shoes of this partnership. We're in this relationship. When we are in this relationship, we are wearing rose colored glasses and we don't necessarily see the signs, but they do. And if that person was a good person, a great person, an awesome person, a person that's perfect for you, your family would like them. The family members you trust. Only individuals that where you honor and respect their opinions. You appreciate their opinions. For the individuals whose opinions I respected and appreciated, none of them liked any of my exes. And it still wasn't enough of a sign for me to walk away. That's a problem. So I would make that one of the biggest takeaways is does my family like this person because they'll be able to tell you just walk I need you to tell me honestly what do you think of such and such and if they say I love him I think he's great for you then good if they say he is mean I don't like him he has no respect he makes you cry every other day then you really got to sit back and reevaluate it and reevaluate this relationship be careful I have seen people ruin their lives over relationships. I have seen it. So I'm going to keep it quick on this one. And I'm just going to leave it at listen to your family. Run from the red flags as soon as you see them. That's it. That's the lessons. That's all you all need to run away from settling. Those two things and you'll be fine. Know your self-worth. Appreciate yourself. Know that you deserve the best. And that concludes my episode of what does love is blind teach us about settling thank you all so much for tuning in for another episode please share this with your friends family and colleagues and i will see you all at the next episode of sour Law sweet lessons thanks so much for tuning in bye bye <laughs>